which we need, I'm thinking we need for acceptance, is large-scale, long-term, randomized, prospectively randomized trials. There are very few of those that have been done. They're very expensive, time-consuming, et cetera. Uh, I like that term coin, Dr. Kesselstyn. Um, uh, Predimed was one of them. And it got published twice because there were some randomization problems and they had to retract and re republish. Uh, it was done, other than the randomization problems, it was done pretty well. The problem is that it's got largely misinterpreted. And uh, those of you who listen to my lecture, because I talk about it pretty much 100% of the time because so many cardiologists recommend a Mediterranean diet, uh, which really needs to be reevaluated because it only reduced stroke. And when you do a combined endpoint, the Kaplan-Meier plot looked really good, uh, you know, heart attack, stroke, and death as a combined endpoint. But the heart attack and the uh, and the death, cardiovascular death, overall death, were not changed by changing from red meat to fish, and so we thought they went after the wrong target, which was changing from one animal product to another, uh, deemed safer until last month. And I'll, I'll remind me to go back to that last month thing. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it didn't do any cardiovascular good. It only improved stroke, and so. Uh, I think that cardiologists recommending a Mediterranean diet, if all you want to do is avoid a stroke, great, but that's usually not the business we're in. That's neurology. Uh, and we need other studies that actually duplicate that methodology, but whole food, plant-based, randomized trials. They're very hard to do. Um, uh, so I've done interventions, uh, South side of Chicago. We're doing one in Louisville uh, right now, if we get our recruitment up. But they're, you know, five, five weeks in Chicago. The one we're planning now, uh, initiating is eight weeks. That's not the the lifestyle or the lifetime that Dr. Esselstyn uh, is talking about with his intervention or Dr. Campbell with the observations uh, the, of how people lived for their entire lifetime. And we, we now understand that heart disease um, really relates to, or that is atherosclerotic heart disease, heart attacks really relates to the lifetime area under the the uh, LDL curve. And so starting early makes a difference. And pretty much everything that improves your LDL will improve uh, nutritionally, will improve your uh, inflammation, your inflammasome as well, because it improves your microbiome. So, you know, it's it, I'm hoping that uh, the heart, I think the hardest for the people who are here is that who wants to randomize people to eating something where you have to kill another animal. I mean, why would you want to do that? None of us want to do that. Uh, but without it, we're, we are struggling. Uh, the last thing I'll say about it is that when I say we're struggling, uh, I agree with the speakers that we haven't, and and with you, Steve, we haven't gotten the traction that, I mean, when you look at, you know, how long it took statins or beta blockers to get into, you know, disease management with guidelines, you know, we've had guidelines out saying plant-based nutrition from American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association uh, since 2019, uh, when I wrote that section. Swift, the fish swam into it, it because of the stroke protection, but the the text is very clear that whole food plant-based diet is what people should be, be eating, and it's largely ignored. Uh, so our most recent publication on physician nutrition uh, called What's on Our Plate, was very disappointing. We had uh, one person doing a whole food plant-based diet out of 274 uh, and another 10 doing the Mediterranean diet. Um, so if you count that as healthy, which I don't particularly, you had 11 who out of 274, and that is terrible. If we don't do the physicians, we aren't getting the patients. We're not getting the physicians' families. We're not getting the communities that they, that they serve in. Uh, and we're certainly not going to get the country to do any better. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I, have a, uh, I just would like to make a comment because uh, I think Kim brought up the, uh, the the problem of doing a randomized study, and I don't. I just don't think that there's an IRB group in the country that's going to be able to look at patients and you take a group of patients and randomize. You have to tell them, look, you may be getting a diet which has been shown to reverse heart disease or you may not get a diet that's going to do that. I mean, that's just ethically totally wrong. And I look a little bit more, wonder what Kim's thoughts are about looking at the scientific method. The scientific method consists of two basic things. One, you make a proposal, you make a theory and you make a proposal. And then number two, 
you do the experiment. And the experiment is either right or the experiment is wrong. Well, if we say that we can halt and reverse heart disease with whole food plant-based nutrition, and then when they do this study and it, work, and, it, and it works, I think we've established the, the baseline from which we can really move, uh, move forward with a fair amount of, of strength. The other thing that has really increasingly more, I find more than ever uh, is a problem. And that is, I think there is a greater responsibility for the cardiovascular community. Because the cardiovascular community, what was it? The American Heart Association was formed in 1924. The American College of Cardiology in 1949. And they have brilliant people on those organ in those organizations. And they all have known that there are multiple cultures on the planet Earth for many, many years. Really, cardiovascular disease was non-existent. However, uh, the problem has been we... We haven't taken that information of why those other societies are so successful. Why haven't we brought it to this country? Because presently the cardiovascular community uses drugs, stents, and bypasses, which have absolutely not one single solitary thing to do with the causation of the disease. And I think we really have to begin to get our cardiovascular colleagues to try to really... Uh, point this out and have them have training in how to adhere to whole food plant-based nutrition for their patients because presently the cardiovascular training is is a deficit in that regard. Thank you. Sure. Let, let, me, let me just ask you a question, Dr. Campbell. So Dr. Campbell, um, Dr. Esselstyn is famous for using the term heart attack proof and a lot of us sleep at night better thinking like, hey, because of our lifestyle, we've really got a control over this or a much, much better chance in preventing this. But what your work was on in the China study was on cancer. And it still seems really terrifying. It seems random. It seems out of control. How much realistically can we reduce our chance of getting cancer if we follow an ideal whole food, plant-based diet, sleep, exercise, healthy emotions? Is this something that we could reduce our risk a little? a medium, a lot, a very lot, um, you know, how do we become cancer proof? I would like to offer you know, sort of expansion of these, uh, this, this is discussion, if you will, into the basic research. And of course, when I talk about basic research, I'm talking about the biochemistry, the physiology and so forth, that in, not, in our case, at least, we worked with experimental animals at that time. Then later followed it up, of course, in the China study, looking to see what we could see with the with the human population. But here, here's the point I want to make, namely, uh, that when we see an experimental animals with cancer, your question, uh, we could turn on and I did that early on in the late 1970s, and I was that's how it really got me into this field. I mean, it, it it turns on cancer immediately within a day or two you know, experimentally, from the biochemical point of view. And and it was really dramatic. And so I looked for more mechanisms, if you will. And I learned something that is applied, in my view, to and to all human, you know, all, all mammals, if you will. Namely, when, when an effect occurs, it occurs by an infinite number of mechanisms. And by us talking about one thing at a time or one kind of disease, I think we make a mistake. That what I saw in the laboratory was so expansive, so profound, and all these mechanisms are all working together, even involving a single nutrient. So then we looked at, and, and, and all one nutrient actually created about, in our, our hands, 10 to 15, no exceptions with a mechanism. They all turned on simultaneously within days, and we could turn it off. And that's how I really got in the field to turn on, turn off, which we did back in the 70s and early 80s. And I was really excited about that possibility. And that's what kept me in the field until later I heard about Dr. Eston, who he was doing with humans. Wow. I mean, I was thrilled to hear that that was a possibility at that time. But the basic science told me, and I think it's still true, that when we collect nutrients comprehensively from certain foods, they all create, they all go, come to the same endpoint. And it's very, very expansive. And and basically, I'm going to suggest that just virtually all the chronic degenerative diseases will respond that way. And as far as trying to do a, uh, 
a, a, a study that follow ups for a long period of time on any one of these diseases, I think we're shortchanging ourselves because I don't happen to believe that in this particular case that we should just focus on one disease at a time, whether it's stroke, heart disease, or certain kind of cancer, or whatever. You know, the whole gosh darn thing works all together. It's, it's, it's in the undeniable. The, the data are so strong, I'm, I'm sure no one will ever showed the opposite. And so I, I don't want to argue for the comprehensive you know, nature of this dietary effect on a whole comprehensive collection of degenerative type diseases that, you know, kill us prematurely. And so, and, and we're got, that, that would account in turn for what I just said before about looking at different kinds of disease rates in the human populations. That they all seem to so to do the same thing and they all start from the XY origin. So these regression lines. As soon as we start putting in, the best indicator of this is consuming animal protein. And that's not, I'm not talking about that all by itself. I'm talking about that's an indication of the kind of diet, diet that you know, all works together. If, I, if, you, if you took a thousand people that had cancer and someone said to you, if those people followed, instead of doing what they did, followed a perfect lifestyle, or well, not perfect, but the lifestyle you recommend, of those thousand, how many of them do you think would not have gotten cancer? Like, does it reduce it by 5%, 10%, 90%? Like, does how you have a thousand people in, in, in who have cancer, and if you could go in a time machine backwards 20 to 40 years, give them their ideal diet and lifestyle, how many of those thousands do you think you could reduce that by? I'm going to put myself out on the limb on this one. I'm going to say at least 90% can be prevented and or reversed once started. In fact, I'm going to suggest more than that. It's going to be equivalent to the heart disease, a study that uh, Dr. Esselton did too. I mean, so that's, to me, that's what the basic science says. We just haven't explored it because we haven't been able to do that kind of study that people like to see. So then let me ask you all three a follow-up question. <clears throat> We're having a 17-day conference. People are speaking about how great sleep is and exercise and emotional health, a whole food plant-based lifestyle. It's great. But the question is, of the people who do this, who eat a whole food plant, a whole food plant-based diet, they exercise, they breathe, they do yoga, they have a loving relationship, they do all the things they should do. How many of those people still get cancer and die, still get heart disease and die? You know, I don't want to paint a picture that like if you do this, you live to 120 and that's perfect. So, I mean, it, are people who are following this still getting diabetes, cancer, heart disease? Like what, you know, we, I don't want to, what is the, the, the actual reality? Um, or are you saying that no, everyone who does this has perfect health, which we know is not the case. So including all the bad results, what's happening with whole food plant-based diets? Is it eliminating obesity, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and everything else? Or is how much of it, or is it just reducing it? So I put my hand up to try to respond to uh, what Dr. Esselstyn said, but <clears throat> let me deal with what we, you just said first, and then I'll sort of go backwards in time. So uh, really quickly, uh, I, I'm very thrilled to be at University of Louisville, be the chair of medicine, be one of six universities that actually has a division within internal medicine of environmental medicine. And it turns out that uh, your genes are important for de developing cancer, heart disease. If you have uh, uh, LP little a uh, genetic abnormality and you have a high real level, uh, a high level, you are at risk. Uh, there are plenty of genes. I have one of them that makes your LDL high. Mine is diet responsive, thank goodness. But there are plenty of other people who have heterozygous familial hyperlipidemia or homozygous, and they will struggle uh, without medications. And the diet doesn't help them as much, although it always helps. So <clears throat> it's almost impossible, I think, to answer your question because we don't have uh, everyone's genome. We don't have the environmental exposure for Louisville on the West End. It's about rubber town and what's in the air. Uh, and we and we don't really have uh, a, a full spectrum of social determinants of health. And so uh, you could talk about what your baseline risk is, but your event rate is, is not just your risk. It's your risk plus what's happening to you. And so <laughs> believe it or not, uh, one recent study 
I, you know, I'm always looking at healthcare disparities and everybody knows that C-reactive protein is really a bad thing to have in your bloodstream. It turns out that African-Americans have higher CRPs, the men because of actual structural racism and the women because of disease things like women having nine times more lupus if you're black than if you're white. And so I don't know that we could ever get to uh, the answer to what you're until we clean up the air, clean up the water, clean up the racism, clean up the poverty, uh, and then be able to select our own genes. Then we can answer your question, Steve. But anyway, going backwards, uh, I wanted to respond to Dr. Esselstyn. Uh, ACC and AHA have indeed um, adopted healthy diet and healthy living. Uh, it's in the 2019 guidelines that I would refer everyone to. If you look at the discussion section of uh, of um, of that document, the primary prevention of heart disease, section 3.1, it'll detail um, everyone's uh, studies about whole food plant-based diet being the best, the optimum diet. The problem is the uptake. You mentioned education. We're not educating the public and we're not ed educating physicians and it's being largely ignored. Um, and that's why those IRB approvals that you mentioned are so important. And the IRBs are indeed approving. We, they certainly approved my Mediterranean versus vegan intervention that we're about to start. <clears throat> when I was at Rush, uh, they approved that intervention. And when I was, uh, uh, and one of our, I don't, one of my colleagues who unfortunately passed away from breast cancer, but <clears throat> Martha Claire Morris had $75 million of NIH money at Rush for the MIND diet. It wasn't even whole food plant-based. And she wasn't really happy with me convincing, trying to convince her that her $75 million was misdirected. Um, but I, I said it nicely, um, but the fact of the matter is um, they're looking for Alzheimer's disease and looking for changes. The IRBs approve these all the time uh, because there isn't, um, you know, if, if, but I understand what you're saying, Dr. Esselstyn, if you just sat and thought about the planet for a moment or about animal cruelty, or about all the published literature that I quoted in those guidelines uh, about human health, there's no way an IRB would approve 